Good morning, Wheatland Church. Well, thank you, Kelsey. Good morning, Wheatland Church. Well, that's a lot better. Well, a little better, anyway. As we begin this morning, I have a couple of announcements to draw your attention to. If I could, at the back of your order of worship, we have our Life Together section. A couple of things to highlight. One, we're going to have an Easter brunch, which um, I believe Luke may have some more information about. Uh, we'll have it between 9 and 12 on Easter. Uh, kind of it's a tradition that we've had. I guess we were unable to have last year, so um, it's good to be restoring it, but it'll look a little different this year. Um, if you're a male, we have a new men's Bible study coming up beginning on April 14th. Um, I'd like to draw your attention, if you're a young adult between the ages of 18 and 30-ish, uh, there's a young adult ministry that we have here that tries to meet together and have some book groups, as well as today they're meeting at the Spatolas for lunch. Um, I wouldn't go right after this service, as you'll be very, very early, but, um, but I'm sure Amber would love your help to set up. <laughs> but uh, at 1.30, if you're in that uh, group, please come and join them there. Also, we have a spring workday coming up on April 10th. We usually have a workday in the fall and in the spring. It's a time for many hands make light work. It's very helpful, and it doesn't matter what skill you have, if you can wash windows or run a vacuum cleaner, you can be helpful. Uh, there's all kinds of different tasks to do from outside to inside, etc. so I'd encourage you to come to that. I believe there is a sign-up in the back, although you don't have to sign up to come. And last but not least, as far as what I'm going to highlight today, is there are Easter flowers that you can order. They're bulb plants that we decorate the sanctuary with, and then after the last service on Easter, you can take the flowers home. So um, please sign up for that if you're interested. The deadline is next Sunday so that they can purchase those plants. <clears throat> My son and I are going through uh, a book now as we begin worship. We're, we're going through a book called Broken Down House by Paul David Tripp. And... I'd like to read two quick paragraphs here, which are a series of questions, and maybe you can identify with some of them. Is there anything that is disappointing you right now? Is there a relationship or situation that is leaving you hurt or confused? Are there personal problems that you simply have not been able to solve? Do you ever feel alienated, alone, or misunderstood? Have you had to deal with mistreatment or injustice lately? Have you been hurt? angry, fearful, or discouraged? Is there any place in your life where you feel like giving up or giving in? Does your life ever seem much more complicated than it should be? Does it seem like you're always having to deal with obstacles of one kind or another? Do you wish you didn't have so many problems on your plate? Does it bug you that even the easy things in life don't turn out to be nearly as easy as you thought they would be? Are there problems in your past that still haunt you? Do you regularly face difficulties you have sought to solve but which still lie open and festering? Have you ever envied anyone else's life? Have you ever wished that you, have started, you could start over in some area of your life but you know you can't? Have you ever felt too weak or too unqualified to deal with what is confronting you? Does your life seem to move too fast for you to ever be able to catch up? Has there ever been a day in your life that was fundamentally problem free. I imagine <clears throat> that you can find at least something in there that resonates with you. Um, or if you're like me, I was beginning to wonder if Paul Tripp was reading my mail or had a video camera in my home as things have been pretty uh, hectic in the last two months especially, but um, <clears throat> in the last several years. The point he's making in the book is what do we expect as Christians though? It's a broken world. So those things reflect that brokenness. But I'd like to encourage us today that the good thing is, while it is a broken world, God says that he will meet with us whenever two or three are gathered in his name, which is how we are, why we're here today. And I'd like to encourage you as the flip side of that coin from what the hymn that we're going to sing in just a few minutes. The Lord our God is good. His mercy is forever sure. 
His truth at all times firmly stood and shall from age to age endure. Join me now as I pray as we begin our service together. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to rise and join with me in our call to worship from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever.
I invite you to read along as I read from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an, an-, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of the world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. come here this morning to worship a perfect God and he calls us to himself and tells us to be like him however because of our fallen nature we are so far we are far from perfect and we fall woefully short so let us humbly confess our sins unto almighty God together by praying almighty God maker of all things judge of all men we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. Forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may serve and please you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please take a minute now to silently confess your sins before God. Father, we confess this morning that we have sinned before you in thought, word, and deed, in what we have done and what we have left undone. 
we ask your forgiveness. We thank you, God, for being a father that pursues us and is about the business of radically loving and restoring us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hear God's assurance of pardon from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forgive not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Let's rise with thanksgiving. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Blessed Jesus, thee we sing. Christian, what is it that you believe? We believe this faith in one God, the Father Almighty, who made the heaven and the earth and the seas and all the things that are in them. And in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who is made flesh for our salvation. In the Holy Spirit, who made the, through the prophets the plan of salvation, and the coming and the birth from a virgin and the passion and the resurrection from the dead and the bodily ascension into heaven of the beloved Christ Jesus, our Lord, and his future appearing from heaven in the glory of the Father to sum up all things and to praise anew all flesh of the whole human race. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you now, as you might feel led, to offer um, short sentence prayers out loud, um, praising God for <clears throat> making himself known to us in the incarnation and the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your radical pursuit of us, for making yourself known to us through the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice for us. May we constantly be aware of your love for us, especially as we commemorate it in this Lenten season. 
Amen. We continue our worship with an oral instruction of what we believe in the form of this question and answer. Christian, what does God require in the ninth and tenth commandments? Ninth. As we come to this time of our offering this morning, I um, want to know, you to know that we're glad you're here, especially if you're a visitor with us. Um, for those of you who have been giving either online or um, taking the opportunity to use the baskets at either end, um, we thank you for that and we're glad that we can continue ministry on this corner by the faithful giving of the saints here at this church. If you are having struggles at this time, please, um, we want you to know and take uh, and avail yourself of the opportunity to let us help you bear the burdens that you're going through um, by offering to you services from the deacons or deaconesses at Wheatland Church, and there are ways there to contact them. So please don't hesitate to reach out. It is not a sign of weakness. It's an opportunity for us to serve you as well. So as we begin our time of offering and considering our gifts before God, let us do so by hearing from First Chronicles. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering and come before him, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Will fail, Christ will hold. 
Brothers and sisters, it is good to be together <clears throat> under the loving arms and care of our faithful Father who is indeed holding us. We are grateful to be together as God's people this morning. We are continuing on this fifth Sunday in Lent to walk through the story of the lost, the two lost sons. And this morning we find ourselves with three more verses, verses 22, 20, well, actually four verses, isn't it? Anyway, 22 through 25 are the verses that we're looking at this morning. And um, in, in, the, in the parable this morning, I think what we are seeing is this move from the forgiveness that the father unqualifyingly pours out on his son. I forgot to dismiss somebody, didn't I? Yeah. Um, let me dismiss ages three through five to go to world children's worship training. I was already into the sermon, like 100 miles an hour there. Um, Lily and Veronica, if you, girl, uh, if you want to meet, not you, sorry, ages three through five, if you want to meet down here with Veronica and Lily, you may. So this Sunday in the sermon, we are going to see the father bring the son from forgiveness that he offers him there on the outskirts of the city into full restoration. And I think we'll see in these verses that the son is restored to himself, to his father, of course, but also to the community and the family that he'd been estranged from. That's verses 22 to 25 this morning. After I pray, Hannah is going to come and read that text for us. But just before I pray, I wanted to expand a little bit about what Paul was telling you um, in the announcement. So on Easter Sunday, from 9 a.m. Uh, until noon, um, the session has been talking about the fact that we did not have Easter services in person last year. And now uh, it's been one year, we didn't have our normal Easter brunch that we would regularly have. So this coming um, April the 4th, 5th, I can't remember, 4th, on April the 4th, Easter Sunday, we have um, sort of gone into some prodigality of our own and uh, in honor of being back together uh, for our Easter in-person services, we have hired a caterer that is going to set up shop over um, right between the Harvest House and the office uh, building. There'll be a tent put up where um, their caterer will have a, a wonderful spread of food. We'll have quiche and we'll have bagels and we'll have pastries and we'll have all sorts of stuff out there yogurt parfait I can't remember the menu but there's lots of stuff that's going to be there you will be able to feast and gorge yourself appropriately for once um, in uh, in glory of the resurrection but also we'll have uh, another tent set up over there in case of the rain so that we can get out of the rain if if the weather doesn't cooperate but we want to invite you to make some time on Easter morning to come and share in our joy that we are back together in some form and fashion and also uh, our joy in the resurrection that we will celebrate with our Easter service. So the caterer will be here from 9 a.m. until noon, so you can come uh, stay a little later if you come to the early service, come a little early if you're coming to one of the other two services and fellowship and be fed and rejoice with us. That is Easter Sunday. I hope you can make plans to be with us on that day. I'm going to pray, and then Hannah will come and read the text. Father, we do bow before you this morning as your people who have in these moments been moved by the love and forgiveness that you have offered to us in Jesus. And we are people who long to be moved into experiencing the restoration that you long to do in us and in your family, the church, and in our world. And Lord, this morning as we think about the brokenness in our world, in a world that has yet to experience 
all of your love and mercy and grace who is still struggling under the weight and groaning under sin and evil. Lord, we remember this morning uh, the tragic murders this week in Georgia and we ask, Lord, have mercy. For the families of the victims who this morning are bearing the sudden loss and the pain of this loss, Lord, have mercy. Father, for those who witnessed and lived through the trauma and are in the middle of processing all of that this morning, Lord, have mercy. For the Asian community that is reeling from this evil act, Lord, have mercy. Lord, for this young man who has committed this murder, for his family, for their community, Lord, have mercy. Lord, in this season of repentance and forgiveness, this Lenten season that we have given ourselves to experiencing in new and deeper and broader ways your forgiveness through our own open repentance, we ask that your gracious love and mercy would heal us and restore us in all of the places that we are desperate. And we ask that you would bring to us your wonderful, glorious life of your risen son into all the places of our death this morning. And we ask that you would do this by the power of your spirit, by the hearing of your word, in the name of Christ. Amen. Luke 15, 11 through 32. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perished here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered, angry. He answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. 
This is the word of the Lord. Well, for three years <clears throat> back in the mid 2000s, I was a part of a church plant in Dallas, Texas, where I experienced the power of a meal in the life of a community. Um, growing up in the church that I grew up in, I had been at more church suppers than I could ever count. And in fact, I think the roots to my addiction to coffee go back to these church suppers where that urn of coffee at every church supper was a staple. And also beside it were abundance of cream and sugar. And they were unguarded by the adults during this time. They always got distracted. And so me and my buddies had full access to the cream and the sugar and the coffee. And we would prepare the most sickeningly sweet concoctions um, at these church suppers. Uh, these things would give Red Bull a run for its money as far as potency, much to our parents' chagrin. But at those church suppers as a kid, I was always an insider. I, I always knew everyone, everyone knew me, I knew what was going on. But in the early days of that church plant in Dallas, not only was I an outsider, but I didn't speak the language of 80% of the people who were a part of that church plant. It was a Hispanic church plant, a, a tight-knit community of first-generation Mexican immigrants. And for the most part, my being there worked out okay. Um, the services were bilingual and that was helpful. And so um, there were always a few other gringos around along with me, but it was the weekly fellowship time with, which was the very center of the life of this congregation. It was at that weekly fellowship time when I really and deeply felt like an outsider. Because during that fellowship time, all around me were conversations happening that I could feel and see that were these warm and intimate and joyful conversations filled with laughter and, and intimacy. But there I was, not speaking the language, with no real way to engage all of that. And it was incredibly isolating at the beginning. So instead of standing around as an, uh, as an outsider, I, I took it on myself during that time to serve people pastel y café, which was cake and coffee. That was at the center of this fellowship time, cake and coffee. And after a while, I even learned to ask the people standing around if they would like some cake and coffee in Spanish. And in fact, that was the only line of Spanish I knew for months and months. Uh, and I could deliver that line like I grew up in the barrio. I owned it. Um, I would walk up to people who were standing around laughing and talking, and in Spanish, of course, and I would walk up to them and say, ¿Quieres un pedazo de pastel y café? And uh, I would ask it with such facility and earnestness that they would often respond, but not in the way I wanted them to respond. You know, I had figured out that C was yes, and no, of course, was no, so that's what I was hoping for. But they often didn't respond with a simple yes or no. What I often got was a torrent of Spanish back at me after I gave my rehearsed line, and this often got me into trouble, um, because sometimes they were explaining to me in Spanish that they were type one diabetic and that if they ate any pastel or pan dulce, they could be in real trouble. But I understood none of what they were saying. And no matter what they were actually saying, I would be right back with a piece of tres leches or a concha, a, a little Mexican pastry. And I was just joyful to give them this food and feel some measure of connection. 
And after a while, people knew that it didn't matter what they responded to my question. And and even sometimes they would respond with ridiculous answers in Spanish to my question that had nothing to do with the question that I had actually asked. And it became something of a joke in the community because no matter what was said in reply to my question, they knew I was bringing the cake no matter what they said. And so that was the interaction that began to grow. And they knew that I was going to welcome them with food whether they wanted it or not. And it was in that little mealtime that we shared, Sunday after Sunday, where even the language barrier that was separating me and my brothers and sisters was slowly dismantled and I was brought into their fellowship And in the verses today that Hannah has just read for us, we see the the son finding full restoration to his father and his community, not so much by words that are spoken, but by a shared meal, actually a feast. And as we look at verse 22, we see this morning that for the first time in the entire story that this parable that Jesus has been telling, the father finally speaks. He's been a fixture all along in the story, but now finally in verse 22, the father speaks. Listen to verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. I find it fascinating that Jesus does not tell the story in such a way that the father addresses his son, whom he has embraced and welcomed and forgiven. I find it fascinating that he doesn't speak directly to the son. The son does not hear first directly from the father. And and I wondered, why isn't, why is it that way? Is it because the father's embrace and unqualified welcome of his son there on the edge of town has answered every question that the son could possibly have? Was it as we thought last week that just the move of the father from the house out to where the son was, was that enough for the son? Was it the humility and the presence of of the father and his embrace and his kiss? Was that everything that the son needed? Perhaps it was. But beyond all of that, what I think we see the father doing is actually even beyond all of those things. Because I think what we see the Father doing in these moments is what was desperately needed in responding to what the Son has said in verse 22, where the Son says, I am no longer worthy to be called your Son. And I want us to pause here and to help us feel how the Father responds to the Son's unworthiness. See, we've been saying all along that the son's initial actions of leaving the father and liquidating his portion of the estate was a definitive act meant to undo himself from his father as a son. That action was meant to remove himself and undo his sonship from his father. And I think... What we see the father doing here in these three quick actions in verse 22 is actually at the father's own initiative restoring this young man's sonship. He clothes him with the best robe. He puts a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. These three actions must be seen as the reestablishment of the son's primary and first and proper identity. 
We'll look at them a bit more closely in a moment, but I want us to notice here that as the son comes and confesses his unworthiness in verse 21, the father in verse 22 acts decisively in the face of his son's confessed unworthiness as a son, not to agree with him and condemn him, and not to disagree that he is unworthy, but to restore his son's true identity. You remember from last week that in the verses above, the fathers sprint through the village to meet his son there on the outskirts of the town. His embrace, his kiss, all of that was his unqualified welcome and forgiveness of his son. And now in verse 23, this threefold action is far more eloquent and f- more far reaching than any words that the Father might say. I hope we can see what Jesus is doing in this story at this point. He is saying no matter what has been squandered by the Son, no matter how far it is the Son has wandered, the Father was always waiting and working for this moment, not merely forgiveness, but to bring the Son through forgiveness into reconciliation and restoration. The best robe in the house that the Father immediately orders be brought out to the outskirts of the city, mind you. The best robe that the Father orders be brought out to where his Son is is his very own robe. It is the Father's robe. It is a, this is a sacrament. It is a sign and a seal of all of the Father's own worth and honor and dignity and righteousness in the community. That robe that is given to the Son is all of the Father's honor and worth, and authority. That robe covers, more than covers, the shame of the son's poverty and recklessness. And in fact, when the community will see that son walk back to the family estate wearing that robe, the community won't see the son, but they'll see the father, in a sense. The ring that the father commands to be brought and put on the son. Most commentators agree that this is probably a family signet. And if the father is doing, as I suggest, restoring the real and true identity of his son in his relationship to him and to the community, then this ring means that the son is an integral part of the family. He's not being brought back in on the margins as a black sheep. Part of the family, but don't let him get near the checkbook. Because, friends, this signet ring means that he is able to conduct business and seal transactions out of the family's life in the community. He is step by step being restored to all that he was as the father's son. And then the shoes on his feet mean that he will not be a barefoot servant in the father's presence, but he will be a true son. And in these three quick actions, the robe, the ring, the sandals, The son is brought through forgiveness into restoration to all that had been lost. But with his sonship restored with his father, there's still more restoration to be done. Listen to verse 23. The father still speaking. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Because there is still more restoration to be done, 
Because that restoration from with the father as a son can never simply stay there. It has to be moved into all of the places that faith and trust and relationship has been broken. The father orders his servants to kill the fattened calf. And he throws a feast for the household and the community. So not only has this son been restored to his father as a son, but now he is being restored as a brother to the household and the entire community. And we can't miss the costliness of this restoration. Meat in those days was not eaten at every meal, uh, historians tell us, and it likely was not eaten even every day. I know we've had some conversations in the office amongst Keith and I about is a salad really a meal? And if a salad isn't a meal, can you kind of make it a meal by cutting up some chicken and putting on it? We've had these rigorous debates, and Samuel has his own view on this, and Keith and I have our own views on this. And, but what's going on here in the text is to be plainly seen that meat was reserved for very special occasions, days of feasting that were rare celebrations. And this was not the common variety of meat even that the Father has called for. What, what would have been probably closer at hand in that day was lamb or goat. And, and sorry to all you devotees of grass-fed beef, the text in the Greek indicates that this was premium grain-fed beef. It had all of that marbling that you look for or that some people look for in a steak. But the costliness is not merely the variety in the cut of meat here. At the center of this costly restoration is the image of a bloody sacrifice. Something that had deep meaning in all of Israel's life in relating to God and being restored to a God from whom they had been alienated with. All throughout the scriptures, it is through blood sacrifice that God's children are brought out of their alienation and back into fellowship with him. Restoration to the family will not happen apart from this costly sacrifice and the feast to follow. The only way for this to happen was at the father's initiative. You see, the son could come back, but only the father could bring this sort of restoration to the family. The son had disintegrated his relationship with father and family. And only the father could restore both aspects of that relationship. And it's here, in a feast, over a meal, that the son and the household community are brought back together. Brothers and sisters, for us this morning, we must be able to see in this parable that the church is a community of restoration. We are a community of lost sons and daughters who have been forgiven by Jesus, but now all together uh, as the family are in the process of being restored to our Father and to each other in our true home, our true and first family now, the church. Listen to verse 24a. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Do you hear what the father has said? He is talking to the family, to the community at large, and he is saying, this is my son. The relationship has been restored. This, my son, he was dead and is alive. He is lost and he is found from the lips of the father. The boy in the community have heard without question that this son is no longer just a lost son. 
but he has been brought from death to life. He was lost and found and restored. And I want you to see what the father in the story is doing. He's saying, this is my son. And to the community, when he says, we must rejoice because he was uh, lost and is found, he was dead and now is alive, he is saying, and now meet your brother again. He is bringing these two community, the, the son and the community back together. And we can't miss the corporate and public nature of this son's restoration here. He could not be restored to his father without being restored to the family. See, restoration was not just about the relationship between the son and the father. Others were brought into that joy. And our restoration, our life, is not just about our relationship with Jesus. But it is about us being restored to our Father and to one another. You see, what Jesus is doing here is creating a brand new kind of family. A, a whole new family structure is being brought into existence in this parable. I mentioned it last week that the father was not like any father you ever knew. The, the father, as we saw him do all that he did last week in coming out to the son, he was not being a good um, Near Eastern father of, of the first century. No, he was breaking every rule and undoing every protocol and turning over every tradition of what it means to be a father. And now, guess what's happening? That is happening in the family. All of the sudden, this family who has been hurt and alienated from this son is now told to rejoice at his return. Jesus' story of the lost sons is creating a new sort of family, a shocking and surprising sort of family that doesn't keep people on the margins who have wandered that doesn't judge them only by their actions. But Jesus in this story is creating a shocking and surprising sort of family that never existed anywhere in the ancient world. And it all happens because of the Father's unthinkable love. Look at verse 24b. And they began to celebrate. Here is a deep joy, brothers and sisters. Our restoration to God, our restoration to one another, in a real sense, comes through this active and ongoing celebration that we gather to do here each week. There is a, a very real sense in which we are transformed into a community of welcome and forgiveness and restoration because of what it is we gather to celebrate over and over and over. The Eucharist, the communion meal that we eat together each week is itself a celebration of lost daughters and sons coming home and finding forgiveness and restoration. And, and each week as we come and celebrate this feast, we are being transformed by the powerful love of our Father that put this feast on the table for us to be the people of restoration and forgiveness. I think one of the things that has come out of this pandemic uh, that's really been foisted upon us as a congregation that we might not have never done ourselves is that we no longer stay in our seats for communion and pass the bread and wine down the aisles or the pews. I, I can't fully describe for you the particular gift that this has been, not simply to share this meal each Sunday, but for me, 
to literally get to serve you each, of, each week with my own two hands. My father used to sort of uh, rib me a little bit about my soft life that I lived. Uh, as a man of letters, he used to call me. And it's a rich gift to finally do some tangible work with my hands as a man of action for a, a few fleeting moments each Sunday. I mean, to greet you personally here at this table, to pray over your children, to feed you with the gospel of our gracious God each week continues for me to be a deep and sustaining joy. In fact, I find what happens down here on the floor during this time, these brief actions each Sunday, to actually be the heart and soul of pastoral ministry. Knowing and being known by a particular people in a particular place. Notwithstanding all our faults and foibles and differences. Laboring each week in the word and in prayer for this particular family. Working with all my heart and soul and mind and strength to present the love of God in Jesus to whole people here who are desperate for life and salvation. This is a deep joy, but all of that joy and what I think is profound imagery really is not solely mine in those moments. I've heard from many of you who have been deeply moved in these moments. I've even heard the same thing from those who haven't even been in the room, who participate by live stream, who have said to me, and I didn't take offense, my favorite part of the service is seeing people come up and, and, and seeing our family come together and take the supper. You see, each week when you come down that outside aisle and then here at the front where you pause and make this turn toward the center, waiting for your turn to come and receive the bread and the wine, do you notice what's happening? You are bring, being brought face to face with each other over this meal of forgiveness. This choreography, this turn towards each other each week galvanizes and displays what we believe and confess about the divine choreography that's actually unfolding in the church as the body of Christ. That is, when we have been embraced by our Father, we come face to face with each other to be reconciled and brought into the family and the community and to be built up as one people. When we come forward to receive the bread and the wine as the broken body and poured out blood of Jesus, we are coming to a gracious feast of unthinkable love given for us by our Father. And the sacrifice of Jesus restores our identity, making us who we were always meant to be, children face to face with one another whose chief concern is their brother, who are their brother and sister's keeper, and children who graciously receive the love poured out upon them by their father. Friends, these little seemingly insignificant movements hold out a world of meaning that shape us and deepen the reality of our union with Christ and each other as the church. And I don't think that phrase from verse 24, and they began to celebrate, I don't think that phrase means that all those invited into the celebration immediately shed their bitterness and hurt and alienation that the lost son's hurtful and painful actions brought to the family and the community. The celebration did not ignore the reality of what had happened in the life of the family and the community. The celebration did not ignore the real difficulty of brokenness or pain and fear, 
But that wasn't the focus of the celebration. The celebration was over what the father had done. He had loved his son through death back to life, from utter lostness to being found. And friends, our life together here is not a celebration that ignores all of the brokenness in a big family gathering like this. Now, there's no doubt you've been to one or two of those in your lifetime. A family dinner where there is profound hurt or anger or brokenness under the surface. But we politely talk about the weather or sports or the kids' schooling or the lack of kids' schooling, and we stay just long enough to get credit for a legitimate appearance without ever getting into the messiness of it all. When we come together here each Sunday, brothers and sisters, we come knowing full well that many here in our family are struggling with all manner of hurt and brokenness. And if you don't bring that awareness into this fellowship, that is a good awareness to cultivate. But we don't ignore it. Rather, we learn to name it and to face it and to bring it honestly and openly to our celebration and our feasting because what we are feasting on is the unthinkable and overwhelming love of our Father that is stronger than death itself. This love is more powerful than all of our hurt and fear and brokenness. This love in Jesus is recreating love that brings lost sons and daughters home. And this has profound implications for us as a church family. It means that as a family of forgiveness and restoration, gathered for healing and restoration, as we celebrate the Father's love for us in Jesus, we are more and more living out that very reality together on this corner with each other. We are becoming more and more a community of forgiveness and restoration for a world that has no idea what that looks like or how that might ever be accomplished. Friends, the church cannot leave this sort of reconciliation and restoration. The church cannot leave that to even the very best intentions of our society at large because it cannot happen apart from the love of our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. It is in the love of the Trinity. It is in the self-giving inner relationship of the Trinity that all reconciliation begins. The church has been given the feast that transforms those who receive it with joy. Now, this does not mean that good work is not being done outside the church. For instance, there are many places outside the church that promote good and desire and work to heal the real and open wounds of racial inequality and injustice. But friends, the church must be a place that is leading the way as a family of restoration and forgiveness. And the truth is, so often we are not. Sometimes we can be more like that family that eats in haste and hurries out before things get too messy. When it comes to something like racial injustice, we can't simply wait for the pain and the hurt to go away. We can't be content that at least it's better than it used to be. We must, as a family here on this corner, offer the world a picture of what a family that is being restored by the love of Jesus looks like within our own life, our own life of feasting and celebration. Brothers and sisters, if the feast of God's love that Jesus gave us does what he says it does in the middle of a messy and complicated and broken family. 
then the church must press on to become that family that is growing in her own restoration and healing. My prayer for us is that we will have the courage to humbly but boldly invite the world around us into our joy and life of forgiveness and restoration and healing. And pray that as we, week by week and day and, and, and month by month, continue to feast because of the love of the Father, that we will be transformed by that love more and more, and that our brothers and sisters around us will be brought in to our life, to find their life in the broken body and poured out blood of our Savior. May it be so by the power of the Spirit, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. We give ourselves to be restored to you through our repentance and to be restored to one another in these moments. In the name of Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, let's stand together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is a right, good, proper, and joyful thing at all times and in all places to give you thanks, Lord God. We join our voices with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing. God, let us proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Hallelujah. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Brothers and sisters, the gifts of God are for the people of God. You may be seated. Friends, this table is a place of nourishment for followers of Jesus Christ. All baptized Christians who trust in Christ alone are in good standing with a church that embraces the gospel, live at peace with their neighbor, and seek strength to live more faithfully are welcome to eat this meal with us. But examine yourselves, brothers and sisters. Scripture reminds us that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And friends, while none of us are worthy apart from Christ to even gather up the crumbs under this table, we come eagerly as one family to eat this meal with faith in Christ and gratitude to God for his salvation in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness but in your great mercies. Amen. And it was in mercy toward us that our Heavenly Father gave His only Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. As it is written, on the night Christ was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread 
and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, come and find your life in the broken body and poured out blood of Jesus. his body here on earth. As we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of him around the table.
people of God, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, preserve you body and soul unto everlasting life. Take this and feed on Christ in your hearts by faith. Brothers and sisters, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ preserve you body and soul unto everlasting life. Take this cup and drink of Christ's life poured out for you. Let's rise and speak out our thanksgiving together. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all your iniquity, who redeems your life from the pit. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He does not deal with us according to our sins. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Ever living God, thank you for feeding us with these holy mysteries, the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son. Heavenly Father, please assist us with your grace that we may continue in holy fellowship with you and do all such good works that you have prepared for us to walk in through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Brothers and sisters, sing out your thanksgiving. Brothers and sisters, people of a compassionate Father, stretch out your hands, lift your faces, and receive God's blessing upon you. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace.